Uh, welcome the people that are in New York Stock Exchange to join us live. Uh, welcome the people that are joining on the live stream. Uh, we're super excited to be here today with you uh, to unveil uh, a new groundbreaking AI platform that we think uh, it's designed to support uh, the creation of digital experiences and bringing an unprecedented speed and efficiency and scalability to this environment. I think we're going to see a future that we haven't, uh, we never seen before in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, we're very excited to be here and, and be part of that journey and to be, you know, uh, leading that back uh, with, uh, with you guys. So we have a, a full lineup for today. We're going to start uh, unveiling a little bit of the, what the platform is. Then we'll have a panel uh, to discuss, you know, the application of that in the enterprise and where, where those all things are going. Uh, and uh, with no further ado, uh, I will turn it over to my partner, uh, Cesar Gon, and uh, global CEO of CIT to get us started. Thank you, Cesar, to you. Thank you. Thanks, Bruno. Good day, everyone. This is a day I've been looking forward to for many years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary technology emerges that changes everything. 77 years after the introduction of ENIAC, the first general purpose digital computer in 1946, I believe we are on the verge of the most disruptive moment in the history of computers on Earth. However, I must start by saying that in my humble perspective, we are still decades behind achieving sci-fi like artificial general intelligence. So let's turn our focus to what is actionable right now, right here. CIT has been fortunate to participate in and contribute to the first chapter of the digital revolution as the creators of the Lean Digital Book of Knowledge for Digital Transformation. Now I feel blessed to guide CIT on co-creating or authoring the next chapter of this revolution, a digital world powered by artificial intelligence. AI is a transformative technology with real-world applications and rapid advancements. It's also the gateway to a new disruption in the corporate world, the one we call hyper-digital. Over the next decade, I believe hyper-digital will unfold in three acts. Act one is hyper-productivity, paving the way for act two, hyper-personalization, and this progression then leads to Act 3, that is the advent of disruptive new business models that enabled by the exponential reduction in the cost of decision, of complex decision making. The challenge with these revolutionary moments is that they tend to thrive in the fertile greenfield environment of startups and digital natives, but often it takes years to make a relevant impact in the brownfield setting of large established enterprise. In a nutshell, these advancements need to become enterprise ready. They must reach a level of maturity where the potential of the new technologies can be translated into, the, into customer value within a framework of reliability, security, and privacy. Factors that are non-negotiable for traditional and successful companies. So this is our ambition. This is CINT vision to make hyper-digital enterprise ready. And to achieve that, we are introducing CINT Flow today, an AI platform for hyper-digital. First, it was a spark. Then, an evolution. A simple sign, 
became a world of languages. AI marks the dawn of transformative era where innovation reaches boundless horizons. So we made our own revolution. <sighs> CI and T Flow, a platform that combines humans and AI agents to unlock the hyper digital for the enterprise world. Increase the speed and efficiency of teams throughout the entire build cycle. Join the flow. So CINT Flow is a platform designed to streamline the interaction between humans and AI agents. It combines CINT experience with artificial intelligence and our understanding of how digital and software engineering should be boosted by AI in our enterprise setting. Our aim is to drastically improve productivity, quality, and speed, empowering teams with a growing number of AI agents reshaping the entire flow of producing digital solutions. The era has come for a new level of digital efficiency. It's time for hyper-productivity to lay the groundwork for hyper-personalization and a new level of customer experience. The time is now for CIG flow. With that, Mars, our global head of artificial intelligence, will introduce you to CIG flow. Please. Mars, the stage. Thank you, Caesar. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm Mars Cirillo, and I'm delighted to introduce you to CINT Flow, a groundbreaking approach to enterprise software development. Yes, as Caesar said, the phase one, act one of HyperDigital has just started with hyper productivity. CINT Flow aims to solve something that bothers us all the digital efficiency dilemma. That is, the more we invest in digital and grow our teams, the less productive we get. The reason isn't obvious, but it's there. Complexity, especially in the coordination of efforts, grows exponentially with team size. That is, until CINT flow. We are on the brink of entering the hyper-digital world. Let's envision a future reshaped by AI, powered by CI and T-Flow, where humans and AI agents join forces to craft innovative digital solutions. It all starts with ideation. The AI agents work hand in hand with humans. Together, they engage in innovative brainstorming, aligning creativity with the market's needs and opportunities, laying a solid foundation for managing the program. Next, the journey takes us to design. AI agents assist human teams by providing real-time design recommendations and automating user stories, streamlining the design process. In the development stage, AI agents support the coding process. Together, humans and AI radically accelerate the development cycle and enhance the output's quality. The testing process is an integral phase and AI agents can automate it adapting strategies for each unique digital solution, ensuring comprehensive quality assurance. Deployment is next. AI agents streamline infrastructure code, optimize the continuous delivery process, manage rollbacks if needed, and ensure smooth transitions to production environments. Finally, we reach operating. AI agents monitor the system in real time and predict potential issues before they affect performance, accelerating the identification and mobilization of resolution. In addition, a master agent will orchestrate the entire flow of activities, collect metrics, uncover bottlenecks, propose enhancements, and optimize the end-to-end -end life cycle, thereby fueling efficiency and sparking innovation boost productivity, improve quality, and accelerate delivery times to create a hyper-digital world. This is the power of AI and humans working together. This is the vision of CI and T-Flow. That is right. CI and T-Flow simplifies and orchestrates the entire end-to-end -end process of enterprise software development. It acts as a master agent coordinating the effort of specialized AI agents to accomplish tasks, tasks uh, interfacing with real humans, that is, your development teams and leadership. They can accomplish their tasks much faster. 
Let's think about in the ideation phase, the work of BAs, the business analysts. They need to craft the user epics. That can be done automatically with just project context and business goals. Those stories can then be broken down in user, um, those epics can then be broken down in user stories automatically and can be perfected by the BAs before they are handled to the designers. For the developers, CINT flow goes beyond code recommendation, right? The usual, um, our usual chat GPT. It will allow developers to communicate with their code and devise the best strategies to implement new features and changes. Our AI master agent will coordinate the entire workflow, ensuring adherence to code standards and security practices. It also informs leadership about team performance and recommends strategies for acceleration. Extensibility. We're building an extensible, resilient platform, digital platform, that can be extended by any team member. You can either use a readily available AI agent or extend it or even create new ones to tackle new challenges. We are enterprise ready. Caesar emphasized the importance of that. CINT flow stands out due to our experience in orchestration. Uh, 28 years of experience in several different segments allows us to fine tune our AI agents so that they can potentialize their impact without compromising security, reliability, and privacy. We are perfecting our AI master agent so that it, it can uncover insights, can provide training recommendations, and uh, bring ideas on how to include, uh, to improve the lead time, productivity, quality, and stability. In conclusion, CINT flow goes beyond a software development approach. It's a transformative force that drives innovation through unlocking uh, the operation efficiency and collaboration. We like to say that on CINT flow, the sum of the parts is bigger than the whole. CINT Flow is currently on private beta with 12 of our biggest customers. We are, interfacing, we are integrating a, a suite of a dozen AI agents, and we have a plan in the next 12 to 24 months to roll out the entire platform to our entire customer base and integrate over 100 new AI agents developed by both CINT and partners. Perhaps this may sound a little bit like science fiction to you. Well, ChatGPT could have been seen as a science fiction not long ago. We are here at the beginning of Act 1, and we have tangible results in productivity, achieving twice as much in most cases. We can only forecast that in years to come, we're going to achieve many-fold increases in productivity. As Clark's third law states, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. We believe CINT Flow is our touch of magic in the making. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Bob that will lead our panel. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm super excited to moderate the panel uh, with our invitees. But uh, just a moment before we uh, start the panel, uh, we have a provocation and uh, a question from uh, Professor Julian Birkenshaw from London Business School. That will be the first question of our uh, panel today. Uh, and we are also with him preparing uh, a paper that we will release in August about the impact of AI and in the enterprise world. So, Professor Birkenshaw, please. My name is Julian Birkenshaw. I'm a professor of strategy and entrepreneurship at the London Business School. With the rapid rise of generative AI technology, I think two important questions need to be answered. First, What's left for us humans in a world where technology is doing so many of the basic things that we need to do? And the answer to that question is not actually that difficult. It's to do with bringing our creativity, intuition, judgment, our personal relationships, our empathy to the fore, because those are things machines can't do so well. The second and more difficult question 
is what does this mean for companies in terms of their distinctiveness and their uniqueness vis-a-vis their competitors? Technology is commoditizing many of the things that we do. It is commoditizing many of the relationships we have. And I think the hallmark of the best companies in the years ahead is that they will have figured out a way of rising above the technology and creating distinctive propositions that really the technology cannot in any way kind of match. That will be the thing that marks out the winners from the losers in the years ahead. With that, let's make the set here. And uh, I would like to invite the panelists to, to have a sit with us here in a second. All right. Um, so let's start with, uh, with the question that uh, Professor Julian Birkinshaw just uh, offered us. And also, uh, I would invite you to make a little introduction of yourself in a, in a tweet or a thread, you know, uh, and a little bit of your vision of uh, AI in the enterprise world. So uh, just to recall, you know, Birkinshaw's question was, what AI means for companies in terms of their distinctiveness and uniqueness. Let's start with the girls, you know, Vanessa or Carol. I can start, yep. Uh, so my name is Vanessa Fernandes. I work for BNY Mellon. Um, I'm the head of digital and experience. Um, following the question, uh, what it means for, at least for the financial industry, right? All the efficiency, besides everything, that Mars explained that we are going to use from, from CINT as well. Um, I think that all the predictive analysis that we can use for uh, investment analysis, uh, for productivity, uh, hyper uh, knowledge on our client, uh, knowing better what they want, predicting settlements, uh, failures. I think that this is all what we can, this is not all that you can use. Um, I think that there are several also risks that we can we can bring and discuss later, but um, I believe that can change and bring a lot of efficiency and uh, our you know knowing better our customers as well. All right, thank you, uh, Carol. Can you give you your sure. little? Yeah, uh, Carol Grunberg. Uh, until recently, I was head of I ran <coughs> blockchain and investments at City, and previously I do a lot of work in Asia. I was at Google and Alibaba launching new payments, uh, uh, payments products. Um, but essentially, to me, AI is really about anticipation intelligence. So I think uh, the breadth of what we'll see with AI, if we use it correctly, is really to anticipate what is needed um, from our clients and also from enterprise. And so um, that's what's most exciting is the intelligence it provides to anticipate what we should be doing and what we need to be doing in the present moment. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, what about you, Stephen? So, Stephen, I'm here representing Bees, part of AB InBev. Um, I think for me, uh, we have to remind ourselves that AI, that all of these things are tools at the end of the day. So when we talk about uniqueness, it's always going to come through the flavor of how the user chooses to use it. And so companies will really highlight themselves from the pack, show their distinctness and uniqueness in how they leverage these tools. And I think that's going to be key, whether it's using it for efficiency, output, quality, data, soft skills, hard skills. I think it's something that we'll see how different people use it differently. And we'll really see people separate themselves and show their true colors. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Rodrigo, what about your view? Um, I'm Rodrigo. I'm an engineering director for CINT for the past 12 years. And my take on AI for the uniqueness, I, I think, goes in the same line that Steven. It's, it's, it's going to be about the interaction of AI agents and human agents and what that mix bring together. It's going to be how we use and what are the use cases that we sell for, how do we interact with it, that is going to drive the uniqueness of the companies and that will actually showcase how companies believe. All right. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, Greco, your last one is hard, right? So, yeah. But uh, your initial comments here. Thank you. I'm Luis Greco, VP of Digital Solutions for North America team at CIT. Um, for me, AI, considering that AI is not new for the enterprise worlds, 
I believe that we are joining a new era that generative AI is unleashing the potential that uh, it's going to be something not for the tech area, not for tech people, but it's going to be for everyone. The unique for me, the uniqueness for me, it's around how can we leverage everything that we are doing, that people are trying to solve, the problems that they're trying to solve, especially with generative AI today as the unique part, is the challenge that the companies will face in the near future, in the next years. And um, the approach will be something really hard, considering that part of our teams, we need to engage everyone to try new stuff, to try to solve problems with the tools that are already available, but the coordination to avoid duplications, to avoid people trying to solve the same problem and leverage and scale everything that we're doing uh, with the tools. So um, that's the, the, the unique part for me, the revolution that we're facing, that AI is not something related to a specific you know, team, a specific structure, but it's going to be something that everyone we're going to solve, not just the tech people, but the business area or shared service and so on. This is going to be the, the revolution in my perspective. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Greco. Um, Mars was, was mentioning the Clark's Law, right? Third law, any sufficient advantage technology is indistinguishably from magic. I have a friend that made a quote, he's not famous, so uh, that says that fear might be preventing us to see the magic or to experiment the magic, right? So my first question here is, and, and anyone can jump, Right, so I and we don't need to have everyone responding, but you know the ones that have things to add, please jump. Um, how companies are getting prepared for the magic? Anyone would like to start? And in the case of Rodrigo and Greco, if you want to mention how Flow can help companies get prepared, that would be good. But let's have our in invitees say something first. So, does anyone remember the first company that had a trillion? Who was that? Apple. Right. And like 17 or 18-ish, right? So a couple years before that, does anyone remember what happened uh, in China? So Google's DeepMind beat a 19-year-old kid playing AlphaGo, right? And DeepMind AI, right? And when that happened, um, President Xi at the time put a private mandate, right, to say that or a federal mandate saying every public and private entity has to have an AI uh, component or program to their company, right? So that was the first country to do that. Because it said there's no way. It was like their Sputnik moment, if you've read AI Superpowers by Kai Fuli, which I highly recommend. Uh, but it was their Sputnik moment, as they put it, uh, to say that you know there's no way that the US could beat us at AI. They beat us at our own game, literally AlphaGo, DeepMind, Google. Um, and so what they did, what that's for them to do is that in two years' time, they went so deep on AI that a couple of years later when Apple entered China and they were, although only 1% market share against Android, such a small percentage, that enabled them using a lot of the AI capabilities that China had with Alipay and WeChat Pay. They were able to understand so much about their clients at point of sale that they were able to utilize some of that, those components to be able to offer and upsell and use real-time intelligence to be able to sell a lot more. You'd walk into a Genius store and you'd buy an iPhone, but you'd walk out with a Mac as well. And so that enabled them, if you go back through the 10Ks, that they hit a trillion. That was the first company to do that because of the magic of AI. And so that's an example that I use that seems like, wow, how did Apple do that? But you look at a couple years prior, what happened, it was this you know, thing that happened with an AI beating, you know, AlphaGo and China getting upset. And as a result, you know, Apple then leveraged it to their advantage and was able to sell more. And then the rest is history. So, um, so that's an example that I love of the magic of AI in real time that we all know. Yeah. Steven, looks like you have something to say. Yeah, and I think I can be hopefully <laughs> short and sweet. I think the, I'll go back to the tool use, right? So remembering that it's a tool, Whenever we go to our toolbox, we have to think about what problem are we here to solve. So I think if you're a business, you're interested in getting involved in using new technologies, any new technology, whether it's generative AI or any other thing in the market, you should be thinking about looking at your business, looking at your org. What do you want to be doing? Where do you want to be going? What's been hard for you, right? Where are your bottlenecks? And I think if you can look at it from that lens, with generative AI and the other tools that are in the market, a lot of things are possible. 
But it's really going to depend on your ability to look at and analyze where do you want to pick up, where do you want to start, and then from there, how do you want to do it, right? So, I mean, we're here at an event. We're talking about some products for sure, and I think there's going to be a lot of products, CINT Flow, one of them, which are going to be able to accelerate a lot of businesses. And I think some cases, there may be some use cases that your business has where you might want to use other products. You need to decide, do you want to have specialists? Do you want to count on other specialists, right? to help you on that journey to solving those problems that you have. So I think you have to start there. Of course, immediately on that journey is going to be ethics and compliance and all the other things that we have to think about now that we think about these new types of tools that are used in new ways. Um, but I think we need to start with the problem first. We need to think about where we want to be going. And to use another famous quote, not try to build a faster horse. I think this is going to totally change some of the processes that we have and ways of working that we have. We can't just think about embedding it in an existing process to get the most out of it. We're going to think about how are we going to change the way that we work. Yeah, and then when you mention about fear, I think that's that's a concept that is on everybody's minds right now about AI, where it's going to go, what we do, it's going to replace or not us. So I think in order for us to determine the future, we need to be part of it. And what I'm saying about that is because I think for most companies right now, they are stuck in a moment, okay, how should I jump in? What should I do? Compliance, legal, security. So I think it's more about let's just do and dare to learn, I'm not saying to throw the rule books uh, out there, but start from a safe place, but start doing something because then you're going to get acquainted with the technology. You're going to know the capabilities. You need to start, not be paralyzed by fear to start. And to your uh, question about Flow, Flow is an enterprise ready. So it's, it's a way to start to having those conversations, understanding the technology behind it, understanding what it can do, what it can do, what it's best for. So I think having just the first, giving that first step like you compare it to magic, so if we go to Hogwarts, like take your first class to understand what spells can AI bring to the game. I think that's that's one thing that will help quiet down a little bit of the fear in the corporate world right now. If uh, I don't know, Vanessa, you want to? Yeah, no, I believe that uh, for for my role that is related to the experience, right? That will be a total a connection to that, right? Because I I will have to understand better my client. I have today, and I think that you know LLM. Uh, uh, models will, will help us uh, to understand better and predict what our client want, um, generate as well a better way for them to interact with us, uh, answer uh, their needs, uh, look into the data sets that we have. I think that that's what is unique, right, that we can use for our company to, to, to establish the, the, the magic is how much we can use uh, for the data that we already know that is, you know, with us. So... I think that that's going to, to bring us a, a huge uh, advantage to understand better our clients. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So just, if, a, just a comment, ahead, Bob. Sorry. Ahead. Just building up on everything that um, everyone said, especially Stephen. Um, the point for me is do not try to stop the movement, right? So everyone is trying to do something today. And uh, the way to start is looking for the bottlenecks. That's the hardest part, right? It's really hard to understand what is the biggest bottleneck, considering that in the end you want to scale everything that we're doing. But do not try to stop people, you know, uh, engage with these initiatives. Otherwise, it's going to be something that they're going to be really, really frustrated. And try at least to create a small team that you're going to start working and understand everything that's happening and, you know, engaging people. And in the end, definitely you're going to find what is their bottlenecks. And I believe that's one of the objectives that we have inside Flow, right? How can we help our, our clients to understand the bottlenecks as well? Not just providing, but recommending AI agents to specific problems that we're going to face. Not just using agents, have a tool that we're going to, you know, uh, we're going to deploy a bunch of agents that we don't know exactly which problems they're going to solve, but help our clients as well to understand the main bottlenecks and how can we prioritize which one? I believe that's we are in a phase in test and learning, and this is really important for us at the beginning because we're going to be able to have you know more data and more uh, experience in how can we help our clients to prioritize the the bottlenecks that we have and be effective on the on the plan to deploy generative AI uh, strategy. That's a really good point because at City, one of the issues we ran into, and even at Northwestern Mutual, was that. I think any company that's more than 25 years old probably runs into this. We certainly had it, is that we grew by product. So the client's information could be spread across 
10 different product lines. Yep. And so we thought, okay, do we need you know, a golden client record or a source of truth for that client before we overlay it right, yep. with an AI program? Or do we extrapolate the information we already have and go yeah. against that? And so I think just start with what you have exactly. is such good advice. Uh, and that's right, yeah. Or else we just, we're just stuck in yeah. paralysis analysis, yeah. Definitely. Great point. Good. Let, let, me, let me jump a little bit to the other side. But I will combine the, the question in, in two, two points. First, what are the barriers or the obstacles, you know, for the enterprise world to, you know, embrace uh, AI solutions overall? And also combining with uh, what are the best, you know, advice or paths you might recommend for, you know, corporations to embrace that opportunity? I can, I can start. I think that, uh, you know, as, as we know, you can amplify the bias, right? Uh, so bring the fairness and, and getting your compliance aware, um, getting your legal uh, working together with you. I think that data privacy is something that we have to be very well uh, uh, aware. We, we, we deal with that and the client will have to give us the consent to, to use that. Um, we cannot sacrifice, you know, the explainability uh, for the models. I think that uh, with all the excitement also to, to use AI, um, I think that we are, we are in the opposite side, like everything now with AI as it was before with blockchain. It was like everything is blockchain and we have to do everything with blockchain. I think that is happening the same thing. I'm receiving like all, you know, the clients, the users asking how we can use that, you know, and bringing the case and say, yeah, but that you don't need generative AI. You know, you can use regular models and, you know, you have other ways to solve this issue. This is a simple, you know, actually problem to solve with regular technology. Uh, so to control also this excitement uh, and to educate our client, I think that is very key. I would add, I think, um, I think it's good to leverage that excitement, right? So like you said, a lot of the cases can be solved with process. A lot of it can be solved with other technology. And now that people are looking at this and they're excited and they're thinking about their bottlenecks and they're thinking about what they could be doing, even if the answer is not generative AI, uh, I mean, I think we need to temper a little bit our expectations. I know earlier it was compared to magic. And for me, my first moments using it were like magic. They were, it was definitely blew my mind. Um, but I think we should take advantage of that and say, listen, some of these things can be done with our old tools, with the tools we already have. And we weren't looking at them because we were too stuck in our ways. But I think the, the balance leads back to the first question. And, and I think the bit of what Rodrigo mentioned is, I think on both sides of an organization, there's the, there's the business itself and the workers. And I think both of them in this moment of this new technology or any new thing that comes that disrupts or changes the market, there's anxiety. And I can see on the side of the business, it's anxiety driven by doubt. Is this hype? Is this the real thing? If I invest in this, is it a distraction? Is this really going to change my business? And on the side of the worker, it's, am I going to be replaced? Is this about cutting people? Is this about replacing me with someone who costs less? Those kinds of things. And I think in order to really adopt it, you kind of have to jump in both sides, feet first. And I think uh, it's important for leaders to understand that a fear-driven team will not be the innovative powerhouse that you're looking for. So if you're, if you're trying to do that, you need to create a safe space, but you need to put yourself in, but don't fall into hype. It's a, it's a delicate balance between, is this really the right tool for the right problem? And how do we, what problem should we be solving in this moment? Are you saying the business does not work? In what? You said the business and then there's workers. <laughs> no, no, I mean the business as an entity. Yeah. But. <laughs> That's a, that's a big questions, right, Stephen? Thank you for the, the big questions. And I, I think this is, this is important. I will jump to a question about leaders. Uh, I think it connects with what you just said, you know, but how can you do that? How can you not be moved by fear or blocked by fear? How can you lead people in their uncertainties? Uh, how do you do that as leaders? Can jump that. Sure. I, I think the key here is, is it's a moment of dare to learn. So that's the mindset of the leader at the moment. So to not just go inside the hype and try to reinvent your entire business or anything like that, but go in, in it with the mindset of 
I need to learn about this tool. That way you open yourself to experiment new things, but not only be trapped by use of generative AI or AI as a whole, you can actually jump in and study your problems, learn how to solve them in a different way. I think generative AI popularized AI as a whole. We just talked a little mm -hmm. bit about that. But that is another tool set that you can leverage to solve a whole different gamut of problems. So it's opening the door. So let's use that as a moment of, okay, I need to learn more about these tools and, and how we can go. I think that's the mindset of the leadership right now that, that will differentiate between not having uh, any fear at all and trying to do everything and having a little bit of mistrust and how do I manage this environment and I want to directly, I think, directly address the fear part, right? I mean, we've gone through revolutions before. I don't know that this is going to arrive to be a revolution like the Industrial Revolution was. But ultimately, that was normalized, right? So I think if you're a business and you're thinking about the long-term the long -term vision for your org, you, in the short term, you might think, oh, I have output gains and efficiency gains, and we can re reduce and contract. But then eventually, again, you'll start looking for gains, competitive advantages over your competitors. And it's going to go back to, we're going to become expecting this level of access of skills, this level of output. And I think people who realize that now will be able to better plan for a long-term future versus getting stuck in a short term. And then I think if we can really embrace that, I think that the fear doesn't have to be there. And you can really embrace the magic and think about where you want to go. Again, I think it's a lot about strategy. Well, I think it is a leader's job, though, to be fearful. Right, and I think, but it's their job also to provide, I think what you said, psychological safety is what you're getting at to the team. Like, I'm a parent, and I think it's my job to like anchor, right, all the furniture so my kids don't like fall off the furniture, but I want them to like climb the furniture so they have confidence that they could do it, right? And so a leader needs to be scared constantly, right? But they need to provide safety for their kid to climb and have confidence to experiment. So. I don't know. I do think that that's what we have to do, constantly be vigilant as we lead our organizations, but let our employees have the freedom to fail, right? I think that's the balance. Um, and that's, the, I mean, that's what we have to do. Well, and I, like you said earlier about the, whether the business is working or not, I think even the leaders should be doing this. This technology is not something that's inaccessible yes. to the leaders in this room. So dive in also with feet first and get a hands-on uh, perspective of what it is that you're asking people to be using and how you're expecting them to be doing it. And I believe that educate, right? Not only, not only learn, but educate our peers, our executives, not only our team, uh, but also prevent, like, what will be the risks and explain to them and try to, you know, discuss and bring panels, you know, within your executive so we can have an open uh, conversation with them so their fears can be minimized uh, because we will not just extinct their fears, right? But we can, we can discuss with open conversation and say what, um, what we can do to minimize uh, the risks, mm -hmm. right? I think that education uh, would be something uh, key. Yeah, and, and just complementing, uh, we, we're going to need to do this on a daily basis, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to need to talk to people and answer the same questions every single day. People are going to be afraid. People are going to, you know, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to be replaced. I'm going to, a new AI tomorrow, we're going to cut a b bunch of people and so on. This is something that we're going to face definitely in the next couple of months until we have more clarity into how it's going to be. And the other part, we need to make clear for all the leadership that um, the ways of working are going to change. The, you know, all the, the, the structure, the team topologies, the way that we used to work is not going to be the same and the next couple of months. And I believe that the best way for us to do this is to start a small experiment. So do in a very isolated way, test, learn, show people results. And after that, people are gonna understand how it works and we're gonna scale this, we're gonna reduce the anxiety of people to not understand what's happening. So I think that's the, it's crucial in the, in the strategy that we're defining that, hey, answer questions. Even if it's the same question, but go there and help people to create the safe space for them to understand the, the revolution that we're facing. That's good. That's good. So um, Caesar mentioned about you know the Act One and Act Two, you know hyper efficiency and hyper experimentation, and we're calling this hyper digital. Um, what companies will offer their clients in with all this technology they're starting to use right now? Is it is it? You know, Stephen, you mentioned a revolution. I think it is a revolution, but anyway, what, what is 
what are you guys expecting that you know companies will be able to do using this technology, thinking about the experimentation of their clients? Crystal ball moment right now. Huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what keeps me thinking, it, it's hard to predict. For me, it's the transformation level of maybe the internet, right? We, we could not predict that we're going to have e-commerce platforms. But right now, I can purchase anything that I like from my phone right now in here. And when I arrive home, it's there already. So that was not something that was feasible or even possible before mobile and before um, the internet itself. So I think AI will bring something like that. It will revolutionize how we actually interact with the digital world, right? It might be, in flow, we say it's an interaction in orchestrating the agents, AI agents with the human agents. And I think the world is going to look a lot more like that, where we have different ways to engage with our um, systems, what we call systems today. I don't know if that's going to be the same. But there are some companies thinking differently, but I still don't think we are on the brink of that. Like when internet was first released, we, we didn't thought we actually just used website with cute flash uh, elements in it and blinked everywhere, right? So I think we're flash. in that phase right now on the technology. Think about 10 years in the future with generative AI. Think about GPT 11, 12 or something like that. When you think that the options and, and it's just it's too, it's too big of a leap for us to fathom, but I think it's going to revolutionize how we interact with digital systems. Yeah, I believe that for the financial industry, it will be a huge impact, right? So um, I remember uh, 20 years ago, a trading desk, like how full it was for, you know, from traders. And today we can have like the trading, 10 trades can, traders can trade like all kind of mm -hmm. books and, 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 and products using the technology that we have today. Um, I believe that is a challenge, will be a challenge for us to keep uh, updated and with better models than what our clients can find, you know, open source out there. So I think that uh, keep the investments high will be key, uh, right? So we can uh, do something that can differentiate uh, ourselves. So maybe learning from the data that they have with us, right, will be will be key uh, because whatever uh, it's out there with open source, they they will be able to to replace most of the things that they rely on today on the financial industry. I think that that would be a challenge. I agree on that one. I think two things. High frequency trading, there's you know so many hedge funds, right? Yeah. I mean, that was like the holy grail, right? You could get that nth of a second, you could make more money, so much more money. And I think that's going to become more mainstream from a like financial perspective. How much more money can you make, right? And a lot more people can make a lot more money. So I think that's one thing that's going to open up the coffers for a lot of people, one. But I think on practically speaking, <clears throat> On the retail side, I think competition's gonna get a lot harder. There's no reason why anyone shouldn't have the lowest price at any time for that item in real time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's gonna get really hard for retail. Um, you know, dynamic pricing on every item um, is gonna be really interesting, whether it's a car, or it's a home, or it's a whatever, you know, a couch. Um, you know, there's no price that should be differentiated in the very near future. So I think retail is gonna get really interesting. Um, and so just inventory in general. So, um, and we're all going to have personal assistants, like, for sure, uh, you know, very, very soon. So, yeah. I think, uh, for me, the things that stand out are about, uh, are about accessibility. I think, actually, this is going to make a lot of things, maybe not traditional accessibility, but it's going to make things more accessible to the consumer, right? I think, in general, for me, uh, generative AI, AI has lowered the barrier in some ways of entry to a lot of areas that had specialized or required specialized knowledge about something. And I think the next conclusion from that is that we'll see a lot more options in the market, specifically when we talk about technology products. We'll probably see a lot more, uh, a low, with a lower barrier to entry, a lot more competition, a lot more products into the market. I think there'll be a period probably where people will be inundated with the amount of products that are there and probably not very easily able to decipher one from the other. Uh, but I think in the long term, uh, it's going to provide if efficiency like we've talked about. I think even to consumers, they'll be able to do things faster. They won't have to wait on long calls for support help. They'll be able to get that kind of help maybe automated. They'll be able to make quicker decisions about buying, dis buying decisions, buying purchases faster if we're able to make that available to them. Um, but I think, again, we have to worry about ethics because we're, they're going to be trusting us a lot. They're going to be trusting the models at some point and the data that we show them a lot. We're going to be using their data in a lot of different types of ways. And the question is, are we going to be informing their decisions or manipulating them? And I think that's the ethical conversation we need to think about. 
in the end, we're, we're saying that um, code is becoming a commodity, right? So it's becoming easier to create code. In the past, we used to have like, we have trillions of lines of code, and this is our, one of our biggest assets, especially for digital companies. And now we are saying that we can produce codes as fast as we can. It's going to be easier. So in the end, your system, your code is not going to be your biggest differentiator. So it's going to be a challenge times for all the companies, especially for the ones that are operating in the digital space. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited with the hyper-personalization, right? The levels of personalization that we can offer to our, to our customers in the end, I think it's going to be completely different. I heard um, a very... A very, I would say, um, it's not on the science fiction side, but maybe uh, the level of personalization that we're going to face in the future, maybe you're going to see different, um, imagine for Netflix, uh, we're going to see different, you know, series or versions of the, 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 same, uh, the same series with different endings. Yeah. It makes sense, but we're going to enter in a gray area, right? Because we want to talk about what happened in the end, but I saw one, you saw another one. It doesn't make sense to have this. But, you know, imagine a, a, a level of hyper-personalization that you can offer in the end. You're going to need to balance, right? What are you going to offer? What are you going to, you know, uh, differentiate yourself to understand better your customer and, you know, deliver what they want? But in the end, you're going to break the social part that, hey, I want to discuss with people, with my friends, what happened in the end and which experience did you face. And if you have completely different experience, it's going to be something really weird. So yeah, this is the, uh, considering the, the, the experience that we're going to provide, this is why I'm really excited with the hyper-personalization. But we're going to need to define, I'm, I'm not going to say rules, but how can we manage the social you know, aspect of this? and you know the the level of experience that it went to deliver to our to our customers and i think that the key is is what you have that it's unique yeah um, in your company right what you know about your client that nobody yeah. does so the data that you have now really becomes gold right so the bank have 230 years right so of of, of data yeah. 20 percent of all the assets uh, under custody so we do have a lot of data we understand how the market works how our client works so now it, it's a time for us, you know, to really, I think, leverage on that, yeah. right? So knowing, I think that that's what you can differentiate, right? Yeah. The models will be out there, right? But the data not. Yeah, I agree. The way that you know your client, I think that will be something very... Bad. And it's something really difficult to deliver today, right? Even with the data that we have to offer a very specialized experience, it's really hard. And this is going to be the act one on the hyper-personalization experience that we're going to provide to our, to our customers. Right. Totally agree. That's good. That's good. You know, uh, I've been listening to you and thinking, you know, so many interesting uh, provocations here. Um, I, I wrote recently two articles on AI-powered leaders. Uh, one was a little more about tools that will support us, you know, our you know, day-to-day work. And the other one was like, what are the more, more profound changes in ourselves, right? And, and my conclusion was that we become more human. The more tech we, we get, the more human we should get, at least. Um, are you already AI-powered leaders? What are your experience on that and uh, how you see that uh, field? So for me, yes. Um, I mean, it was... <sighs> I don't know if I should be confessing this on camera, but... <laughs> <laughs> to the world, Stephen. Yeah, to the world. Uh, but for sure, I mean, it, it was one of the first things that I thought to do uh, with, with ChatGPT, actually, was uh, as leaders, we get a lot of feedback about our leadership style, right? The way we give feedback, the way we conduct a, a meeting, the way we talk, the way we inspire. And uh, I know I've gotten feedback from a lot of colleagues over the years about my direct uh, communication style. And so I, I asked it, I said, hey, if I give you a piece of feedback about, a, about a, an employee of mine, can you spit it back to me in eight different permutations, right? Whether it's kind or unkind, direct or indirect, soft or harsh. And now those are all tools that I have in my toolbox, to go back to the earlier analogy, that I get to decide when I come to a conversation, am I going to bring 
the original flavor of me or am I going to bring a flavor of me that I'd like to be? You know, we get a lot of feedback from HR teams. Oh, you have to be kind and direct, kind and direct. Well, if I knew how to do that, I would have done it, you know? Like, uh, and I think that's, that's hard. But I think it, it's, we think a lot about output and efficiency, but not about the way, this is a language. If we talk about ChatGPT or, or, or GPT in general, we're talking about a language model, right? And, and there's a lot there to be gained when we talk about the humanity also. And I think there's not a lot of that emphasized today in the marketplace, in the business world. And, and I think it's something that we can leverage a lot. So I, re I recommended it to all of my managers. I used it to come up with soft skills, matrices, all of these things that are really hard for an organization to do and prioritize, uh, we were, I was able to do using this. So I would say for sure. If you're not using it for that, start. It's your coach. Yeah, yep. for sure. You cannot go mint, right? What, what you have to say. And I think that once you read it, you learn again, right? And then you say, okay, yeah, I didn't think about that or saying that way. So yeah, I learned something, right? So that, that's uh, the advantage of it, yeah. I, I like this approach of um, considering AI as a tool and what is the elements of leadership that we actually need to do on a day-to-day -day and how to prepare to talk to your team or how to prepare a presentation or how, all of those things are hard for us to do and takes time from us actually creating or generating the vision, trying to push everybody to go in the same direction, generating consensus. So going in that direction, I like to see AI as a tool and I'm definitely using that on my day to day. But I, I don't know if I would call that AI powered leader at the moment because I think that might mean a, a lot of different things. Right now, I think we're leaders using AI tools. I think okay. it's the best approach for at least on how I classify myself. Uh, we use AI tools for a bunch of things to speed up our day-to-day, -day, but Stephen mentioned earlier that we should not try to just um, be more productive in something that we're doing, but trying to vision how we're going to be in the future and reinvent. I think as leaders, that's something we need to do as well. How AI can not only help us give better feedback, but actually change how we operate. Leadership within the AI world, I think, is going to be a little bit different than what it is today. A little bit? A little bit. Trying to be kind to myself. <laughs> <laughs> And one thing that's been so useful, I don't know if uh, you guys have used Otter AI, so like mm -hmm. a plug. I mean, I love it because it's unlike Zoom where you could record it, it also just gives you a transcription of every meeting. And it kind of goes to meetings for you if you're not there, which is a little spooky. So that's a different thing, but <clears throat> but um, but that's been helpful. So you could be, I mean, so to Bob, your point, like being totally present in a meeting because you know you're going to get a full transcription of the meeting anyway. Um, so that's helpful. Um, I love it for that. Yeah. Yeah, if, if I consider myself one day that I'm not only really using anything, there is there is AI embedded, I would say that, yeah, I am an AI empowered leader, definitely, because every day you're using something that was empowered by AI, especially today, not just on the soft skills, but on the hard skills as well, as Rodrigo mentioned, the, you know, presentations, everything that you're doing, you're writing an email and so on. So, yeah, definitely. I think that's the evolution that we're going to see. It's going to be more and more. You're going to be empowered by AI tools. I, I don't think there's another way because everything that we are using today is even Gmail. Right now you have, you know, you're writing the emails, there is an AI, you know, helping you to write the email and so on. And, you know, I think that we're just finding all the use case that we can use with ChatGPT or any other tool that are available in the market today. This is the, the beauty for me is that every day we are learning, learning a new use case, right? The way that we can use the tools that are available and they're infinite. This is the, the, the beauty for me. I think what's been hard for me too is towing the line, right? So a lot of times one of my team members now will come to me and ask me a question about something and I'll say, okay, so what did ChatGPT say? Before, I don't wanna know anything. I wanna know, did you start somewhere else? Did you look somewhere else? Did you talk to someone else before you came to talk to me? Because there's a lot of knowledge that I have, tribal knowledge or historical knowledge or whatever it is, but ChatGPT has a lot of knowledge also and a lot of ability to reason. And so I wanna, I, I'm trying to get them to think about using that as a first course of action and resolution. Of course, always validating it. Sometimes it's wrong. But going there as a first course of action and only escalating to leaders for information that really must come from them. And, and I think over time, that where that is, how much information that is, is going to change. Right? We're already starting to index our knowledge bases inside of our companies and starting to be able to give... Uh, people the opportunity to ask questions directly to our knowledge databases or, or our documentation. So I think for me, it's hard to toe the line between still being a manager, still yeah. being involved and not just directing somebody to a machine. 
because it works really well. And I think that's where my today I'm over indexing on it and maybe I need to tow it back a little bit. And I think you bring a great point because if we're talking about AI automating most of our language stuff, and I'm going to stick to the point of coding, like creating digital products is about expressing in a language that is very much like contained, right? Like programming language is not any more than English, but very contained. When you think that, then the day-to-day -day job of a, a coder or a designer, it's going to be managing AIs. So it's going to be managed by, so that's why I say, you as a leader now, you're a manager of, of managers just by nature, right? That's going to happen. So now it's more about giving direction, keeping on the track, and maybe using AI to be a better version of yourself, like you mentioned. Like, can I use this to improve on things that I couldn't buy myself? Maybe that's the human side, right? Yes. Yeah. AI Those helping us to be right. better right. humans. I think that, yeah. The other you day I was You mentioned a, a very real possibility for us to, to become a better human. The other day I was in a flight and I was, you know, in an argument with Caesar. You know. <laughs> and, you know, it was getting hotter and hotter. And at a certain point I said, GPT, what do you think is, are the emotions behind what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, pretty aggressive, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, maybe I changed. And what about now? No, now you got the point. It's not aggressive anymore, right? So it was kind of a very human interaction. I was not looking for advice. I was looking for understanding. Right? Because maybe my emotions were getting a little bit higher. You no, know, like Stephen, you no, know, being honest and, and open about things. And uh, but uh, it, it's very interesting. Uh, I have uh, we're approaching the end of this conversation, but before I have one question, do you have uh, strong don't do's? <laughs> don't do that, you know, to yourself, to your teams, you know, in this moment. I'm going to start with, the, I've been saying ethics and compliance for a large portion of the conversation. The first thing that we did at Bees before we implemented anything was good talk, of course, to our legal team. And they gave us a laundry list of things, uh, as you can always count on the legal teams to do, that you should absolutely not do. So I think for us, in our org, it's you know not using it in the context of work for personal things, uh, not sharing with it confidential data, even our internal instance, because internal people have access to that data. Uh, not using it to make decisions about people, so about hiring, other than that we believe, at least for the moment, that that should be decisions left ultimately up to people. Um, and uh, I, think, uh, I think those are the general lines of, of what you should not be using it for. Also, arithmetic. For whatever reason, the language model is bad at arithmetic. So if you, you can ask it back for a formula, but don't ask it to do math because it's probably <laughs> going to be wrong. But I think those are the things, the big don'ts. Um, and also, don't just jump into it for the hype. We, we brought a blockchain earlier, some of these other things that have been, I mean, that have uses. But I think we saw people over-indexed on them, and the market's kind of calmed down on some of them. So don't feel like you have to use it just because you feel like you have to use it. Sit down, like we talked about earlier, figure out what you want to do and why this is the right tool for it or why uh, you need this level of personalization, why you need this extra efficiency and how you're going to plan to use it. Uh, if you just start signing up for <laughs> tool usage for things you're not exactly sure what you're going to do with them, it's not going to be ideal and you're going to feel weird about it afterwards. Um, so I think those are the don'ts. I, I would say don't sacrifice explainability again, and, uh, and also don't let the AI do it without oversight. I think that human oversight is it's, it's key for, for the whole process. I think that uh, we need to keep the eye on it. I was going to say, in, in the compliment to that, like, don't also stay out of it, right? At least try it out <laughs> and see, because we're talking about a bunch of compliance problems and all that, and that will happen, but it will not happen if you don't try and if you're not involved, at least a little bit. Like, so for me is don't stand on the sidelines on this. Um, uh, the easier way to um, predict the future is to build it. So be part of it. Just Try to try it in your organization. Don't stand in the way. That way, the problems will appear, but you'll find ways to solve them. And if you truly have a use case, then you, the results will speak for themselves. Yeah, but don't try to solve all the problems using ChatGPT. Or you know. <laughs> today is really easy, right? Every type of problem that we see, hey, let's you know, using ChatGPT to help us to solve the problem. It's much more complex than that. So bring people that has AI understanding to the conversation mm -hmm. at the beginning. So do not try to give people every 
type of, you know, everything that uh, we are trying to solve is using ChatGPT or any basic model language um, and try to understand better the problem, not just, you know, go there and, you know, ask the, the developers to develop an accelerator or anything like that to solve a problem that you really don't know if it's a big problem or not. So uh, as soon as you start to work on this, you're going to realize at the beginning that this is a, a big problem if you give a lot of uh, empowerment to the teams. It's going to be really difficult for you right after to manage everything that's happening in scale the learnings that you're, you're getting from the experience. So do not try to solve all the problems using ChatGPT. That's my, my point beyond the, all the ethics and compliance and security issues that we need to address at the beginning. All right. So we're approaching the end of this conversation. It's been a great conversation. So I want to end this with a little uh, final moment. Uh, and invite you, each one, to, to, to complete the sentence. When I think about AI, my feeling is? Excitement. Excitement. Get the job done. Get the job done. Yeah, vast. Yeah. What? Vast. Vast. Rodrigo stole my word. Yeah, me I, too. I mean, yeah. geez. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Mine it's, too. it's really excitement. Yeah, me too. Is excitement, you know, a positive way to see the 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 you know the challenge that we're facing in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, let's end this conversation with the hashtag excitement on our minds. Uh, I would like to thank Vanessa, Carol, Stephen, and Greco and Rodrigo for being here. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation, and I would invite you to a round of applause to our panelists. So I will now invite Caesar, Caesar, to come back for our final remarks of our day. And uh, let's click it here. All right, Caesar, with you. Thanks, Bob. So, just final words here. Just thank you, everyone, for who joined it and watch it, our event, including my colleagues. Thank you for the panelists and the teams from CINT and NICE. My entrepreneurial journey of 30 years mirrors that of CINTs. If every transformation made for and alongside our clients, it's a special moment, a special moment where we have more questions than answers. It's a moment that requires humbleness, courage, and I would say bold collaboration. So at CINT, we are committed to partnering with each of our clients, co-creating the future in this new chapter of innovation and endless possibilities. As for me personally, I feel really blessed to believe in such exciting times. So thank you and join the flow. Thank you, Caesar. So thank you everyone that is online in the world uh, watching us. Uh, we see you again soon. Uh, join the flow.